I realize my mic's went on. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're just waiting for Jason. Learn about life saving ideas. Mm -hmm. You get to learn about life saving ideas. Oh, thank God. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Or on polo. Hi, Jason. Hello. How are you? Good. Uh, let's just wait a couple more minutes, but like you have a big crowd already. So perfect. Hey, everybody. Hello. Thanks for joining today. Nice to meet you. Yeah, just tell me when you want me to start and I'll uh I'll share my screen. Let's see how many we have. Um one more minute just in case. Of course. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop sharing all yours. Cool. Um, hang on one second. <clears throat> Just updating one slide here. Cool. One sec. Cool. Let me just uh, do a little share here. Let me go full screen for everybody. Um, hey, everyone. So I'm Jason Graff. You saw my bio page before. Um, I'll just introduce myself really quick. Um, 
I work at Area 23. It's a healthcare agency. Um, I am an uh, executive creative director there. I've been here almost eight years. Uh, but to rewind a little bit, um, I've been in the business a little over around 20 years. Uh, I started in consumer. I've worked at um, Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, Publicis. Um, I've worked on, I've ran Wendy's. I've ran Trojan Condoms. I've ran Procter & Gamble and Tide. And I've had like, um, you know, I I come from an advertising family. Just to kind of give you a little perspective, my father uh, was considered like one of the mad men of uh, advertising. He, he uh, created a lot of the Volkswagen Beetle work in the 60s. So like I grew up on sets. I used to even be in commercials. I would be in print ads. I would travel on all my father's like um, business trips when he was shooting with all these great photographers. So like there was this allure. This was this like, uh, what is this business? Like everyone was like looking at, you know, baseball players as these legends. And I was so into advertising, even at a young age, I was like looking at all of these luminaries from Doral Dane Burnback as like the top people in the world. And, um, and I, I clearly, I, I had so much passion for the business. I went into it, went to school of visual arts. Um, I ended up teaching at the school of visual arts for about 10 years afterwards at night because I wanted to start giving back. So teaching and sharing some of my wisdom is just part of my DNA and I can't help it. Um, so I was really thankful to be asked to talk a little bit about um, healthcare advertising, um, what's happening in the field, where it's going. And I'd like to think that from an agency perspective and some of the work that we're creating, I feel like we're at the forefront of, of, of pushing where things have gone. Like if you would have said to me, um, I don't know, like 15 years ago, Hey, do you want a job in healthcare? I would be like, absolutely not. I am on this consumer path. I am loving everything I'm doing. Um, but there's a, a there's been a shift going on. Um, my boss, Tim Hockey, who runs the office, um, sat down with me and he's like, I want to be the Droga. I want to, I want this place to be known as the best agency. Yes, for healthcare. Let's do the best work in the world. Let's create life-saving ideas like we're talking about today. But I want, I want to be seen that way. And when I saw that much ambition, and I have a lot of it myself, we aligned and said, let's do this. So I took a lot of my consumer work and I, I didn't know all the rules, which has been amazing for my career in healthcare. I still have a little bit of um, ignorance in some respects. Like, some people say you can't do it. Well, I'm like, well, well there's got to be a way, right? And that's what this presentation is all about, is ideas that should have ended up on cutting room floors, ideas that could get pitched to clients, but for 10 various reasons could die on the vine, right? And I'll just kind of take you through our philosophy. And I think you'll see this is embodied in all of the work and everyone can like talk the talk but I do with outputting cliches, I feel like what we're trying to do is we are absolutely walking the walk and pushing our clients to do work that that is at the highest level. I don't look at it as healthcare. I just look at it as work that, yeah, that's saving lives. And if you look at some of the best clients in the world, like Citibank or whoever, they are talking about how they can create societal change, how they can push this world forward. I just feel fortunate enough that I get to spend all of our budget doing that. It's, I don't have like a small budget like I used to on my DTC accounts for it. Now I get to live it every single day, right? So um, innovation, clearly as you're reading, it's everything we do. We think it can solve real world problems. We know it can for any target, whether it's for people, whether it's for doctors, doctors are human. I don't want to, you know, no one can tell me, well, you have to be safer because it's a doctor. I won't hear it. I won't listen. Like an empathetic, insightful, humorous, provocative thought resonates and it doesn't matter the target. So for me, when it comes to innovation, we're going to push, we're going to, you know, build utility into the everyday so that people can live better lives, right? And we call it... Um, Everyone's got a philosophy, right? Ours is called the wonderful world of what if. 
And um, on top of my day-to-day -day work, which I'll show you some of the things that we've created for our clients who are looking for it every single day, um, we also give our creatives 10% of their time to have blue sky thinking. We actually pay our employees to dream. And we've worked it in my finance, uh, luckily my finance department is not on this call, but that's just what we've, you know, we've, we've successfully, and I'm joking around, worked with them to say, if we want to deliver world-class ideas, we need to figure out a way to have the time to do it. And that's what I think we've successfully done. A lot of agencies can talk about it. I'm not here like promoting Area 23 today. I'm promoting life-saving ideas, but I don't think you can get there without a philosophy that you know, you can truly deliver on. So with that, let's kind of get into it. Um, I apologize. Some of this work today will be highly emotional. This is all work that I've personally created. Um, I'm fortunate enough to partner with, you know, one club and we enter in every year in the one show. And um, you'll, a lot of this work has been awarded here. I just thought it would be great to feature the work in such an amazing organization and an award show. Um, because I do, I've always respected the one show from my first day in the business um, because my father was winning one show in its second year in like the 1973, I think it was or something or 74. So I just, um, I, I hold it at such high regard that I just wanted to keep the bar of the work here. So I apologize. There's going to be some moving work. There's going to be some work that could you know, you know, it may make you cry. I, I apologize for like, if there's any emotions, I just think that in order to do great work, you either make people laugh really hard, you make them cry really hard, you make them feel really hard, get the chills, whatever it is, but we need to, you know, we need to go there. So this first one is for um, creating innovation, right? For kids living with cystic fibrosis. So about three years ago, I created um an initiative or an innovation called Sick Beats. And just to give you a really, I have case films for everything, so I'll keep it short, but cystic fibrosis is a disease where you, you know, to keep it simple, you get a lot of mucus built up in your lungs, right? And um, through the years, it wears on your lungs, right? And one of the things that children do is they wear a vest. And what it does is it kind of like pumps the vest, pumps your lungs, and it breaks up the mucus and you could do it once a day. Sometimes people have to do it three times a day, depending on you know the level of the disease. And it, let's just say it's it's probably the worst part of the 15, 20 minutes of their day, right? They're just sitting there. So we thought, how can we bring a new standard of care? How can we actually create something that can turn the worst part of their day into like just a better part of their day that they can actually enjoy while we're actually healing them and giving them the necessary um, utility in their life. So I'll just kind of leave it at that um, because our case film goes into a lot of the detail, but Sick Beats is the world's first music powered airway clearance vest. And this is what we did with it. Having cystic fibrosis means that my lungs don't work as much and have a bunch of mucus in them. This is my airway clearance vest. It hits my chest over and over and it loosens the mucus in my lungs so I can pop it out. Kids with CF, we have to do this all the time. Wearing the vest is the worst part of my day. I'm so thankful my vest is here. Turn up the volume. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it really works. That's cool. There is a specific sound frequency, 40 hertz, that is proven as effective as traditional CFS therapy. It loosens mucus so patients can cough it up. The Wooger Sick Beats Vest syncs to your smartphone and pulls these frequencies from the music you're listening to, delivering them to the chest in real time. The Sick Beats experience operates through Spotify, 
we scan the 30 million songs on Spotify to collect the songs containing the 40 hertz tone and gave the CF community dedicated access to the therapeutic song library simply by following the Sick Beats profile on Spotify. In the Spotify app, kids can access thousands of therapeutic songs and discover new playlists to make their CF treatment the best part of their day. <laughs> I'm going to share a bunch of cases so, you know, we can go back at the end. If you have questions about anything, please like, you know, we'll go back to the work, but uh, I'll just take you through a little bit of like the breadth of what, you know, what we've been up to for the last couple of years. Um, so the next thing, this was just in one show last year um, that uh, we won best of discipline, which was I'm so happy because what I always try to tell everybody I work with is like design things that the world needs. And if it, you know, if we're fortunate enough to be awarded, that's a great thing. It's an outcome of it. But just like, I just tell everybody do the best thing in the category that's never been done before. And it will bring great things for those who you're creating it for. And for those in the industry and yourself in the end um, is a nice outcome. But uh, this one in particular, um, one of our clients, Horizon Therapeutics, um, we have a brand called Tepeza, and there's a few different disease states, but in this one for thyroid eye disease, over time, like if it's not treated, you can go blind, right? So what I love about working for Horizon, which is now Amgen, is that they constantly do above brand work. So they'll talk about the brands they have, like a Tepeza, but they will talk about the work that they will do for the blind community, uh, for the advocacy groups, and uh, basically partner with us to innovate for products. And that's what they did here with us this time. So this is called IDAR. Um, so we're calling this, um, you know, allowing the blind to visualize with sound. So, we, you know, a lot of these things just come from inspiration, like, you know, started looking into the fact that the blind have the ability to echolocate, right? So they'll kind of, they'll click and those clicks, those sounds, these echoes off of the surroundings that they have. So we met this really interesting guy uh, named Brian Bushway, and he actually can skateboard. He can do all kinds of amazing things because he has mastered the art of echolocation. But the unmet need and what we realized is only 1% can truly echolocate. So is there a way to like bring this massive, this mass like echolocation through an app to the world so that people can kind of train their minds to hear sound and those sounds can actually represent objects and those sounds can help them navigate and work their way through the world, right? So that's what we did. And so there's LIDAR, which I'll get in, you know, it's all in the case film, but LIDAR is on our app. So what we did was we figured out ways to like work with LIDAR. Then we actually had an all uh, a fully blind UX team on this because there really aren't visuals. It's all through sound. So we were able to work with them to talk about what is, what should an app sound like if you're blind, right? And then of course, how do we build the utility in to make it simple so that they can use it? So um, I'll just kind of share the uh, the case film, but just really, really proud of this work and what we could do for the community. The idea of blindness is worse than the reality. You just do not understand our full capacity of what our senses can do. Humans can see with sound. Sound reflects off of objects in the human brain can image what they are, where they are. So few people can do this. And so if we have taken the principles of echolocation and made it accessible to all. As someone who was born without eyes, I wanted to design an app that could allow blind people to visualize the world. IDAR is a free app that digitizes the principles of echolocation. 
It uses LiDAR, a 3D mapping technology available on the latest smartphones. This technology creates an image of a person's environment and then translates them into a 3D soundscape of their surroundings. As you move closer to an object, changes in pitch and volume communicate size, shape, distance, and direction. IDAR users start with basic object recognition and through sequential training, progress through more complex tasks. Training the brain and enhancing visualization abilities, giving them the skills they need to navigate the world with confidence and precision. Being blind, people don't expect anything out of you. They'll set the bar low. They won't expect you to go any higher than that. I'll make my own expectations. I have a lot to prove to myself. And there isn't anything that I can't do. That's IDAR. Um, one thing that is really close to my heart, and I really push all creatives at the agency to do is create emotional utility, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of people going through different diseases and we need to inspire them to kind of uh, get up, right? And to face whatever it is that they're going through, right? Um, so this is for soft tissue sarcoma. It's a very rare cancer. Um, and I, like all of us, right? Like we're working on products, we're working on things. And when I was briefed on this, I think the, the, uh, the brief was start with strength. And it, you know, obviously it resonated with me and I, I tried to imagine what it was like to hear from a doctor, you've just gotten a diagnosis, right? And it's a very heavy moment. So what would you do? And, you know, for me, you know, maybe I would, you know, go into the room, think about things, lie down for a moment, try to get my game plan together. Uh, think about it, looking up at the ceiling, wondering, you know, all right, I'd put it together, get everything in my life as far as what I need to move forward. So I get my um, self-agency together and then just help tackle it and go for it. So that, that triggered a, a campaign that started with everything was just all the print ads, of course, had um, lines on the ceiling about get up because you're scared because it's not fair because you're still you when you get up. And that was like a really nice way to kind of bring you in from a print perspective, but it, as we all know, there's nothing greater in this world than activating a brand and finding the soul of what your idea and your campaign is all about. So I created the first social media alarm clock. And uh, this woman, Maggie, was amazing. Um, we actually shot a documentary with her. And what we did was we created an alarm clock that was triggered to um, her social uh, to a social account where people can DM without her knowing messages of strength that we would then project when she woke up in the morning and she would help her get out of bed. Right. So we shot this documentary and it was pretty special. You'll see it's like the first time her seeing it, not knowing that we had done this for her. And to me, like there's nothing greater in this world. It's like when you sit in focus groups and you're like, you see your work and everyone's commenting. You're like, oh God, all right, enough. All right, thank you. I know you're giving me all your comments, but there's nothing greater than sitting on a couch and watching someone react to your work right then and there and realize that you're actually making a difference and you're helping with them. Um, so this is the get up alarm clock. And here is this you know, video. My diagnosis was really terrible. Doctor told me I had um, soft tissue sarcoma. Some days I don't handle it well, but I want to get out of bed because I want to see my family. I want to be there for them.
hey, babe, remember a year ago when things weren't going well, you told me to start to put together a list of replacements for you? Well, now that you're hanging around, should I really hang on to that list? Love you, babe. Bye. Oh, you wise ass. <laughs> I'll keep the list, you know. Thank you. <laughs> the Get Up Alarm Clock operates through Twitter. We created a custom DM inbox for patients and invited friends and family to send them messages of support. The 3G enabled alarm clock aggregated the daily messages for cancer patients and projected them onto the ceiling at the user's desired wake up time. It makes me want to stick around a lot longer and fight a lot of the odds that are against me. When you have cancer, stay connected to the outside world can make a real difference in your journey. Now I can provide more than just treatment. I can provide a level of emotional support that I could not prescribe before. Other alarm clocks, they just wake you up. But this one makes me want to get up. If everybody had that, the world would be a better place. So what, what I love about healthcare is that like there's all these regulations, right? But there's a few things you can't regulate. You can't regulate emotion. You can't regulate craft. I can do anything I want. You know, like, I, yes, there's some rules, but you can't tell me how to art direct. I'll, you know, I'm going to get the best designers. I'm going to get the best filmmakers. I'm going to get the best um, typographers. I'm going to do all of it uh, because there's money to do it. And people want to work on great projects. So that's what I love is like, there's all these rules. I don't listen to them. I don't care about them. The ones that are legal, that are from, you know, how you need to use and the prescribing information and all that. Sure. Of course, those are essential and those are important, but how we communicate brands to the world and bring them to, um, there's a lot of flexibility. And I've learned that through every single um, assignment that I've worked on. Um, it just takes a lot of pushing and a team and an account person and a strategist, nothing new there that believe in it. And to have every person at every level all in, right? And it's easy to say that. And it sounds all like cliches, but you know, I've I've never personally worked at an agency where creativity is as consistent as it is because year after year, it's easy to like, yeah, you get something into the one show. It's like, oh my God, best day of my life. I, I got a gold pencil. It's like, that is it, you know? But if you could just like know that a, an organization like the one show respects the work you're doing year after year, you feel like you're doing something. And that's when you cultivate a career. And I feel like Look at anyone, anyone who's done the best work. If you look at from the start day one of their career, when they started with the one show and being represent, you know, recognized to their last day, they're there for a reason. And those people end up becoming hall of famers. Like they are, you know, one show is about to do now. Uh, it's just incredible. So, uh, you know, obviously a big fan of the one show. Um, so another thing, um, emotional utility is one side of it, right? Physical utility is the other. And we are fortunate enough to be in a position where we can bring, you know, physical things to help um, them along their disease journey, right? So this is for traumatic brain injuries. This is for a brand called Constant Therapy. And if you look to the right, Everything in that visual that is on that tongue starts with an SH, shark, shoe, chic, shovel, shower, right? Shield. And for people who have had a traumatic brain injury, everything is different. You can't bring words to, you know, be said like we can. So I wanted to kind of create that experience of what that's like. So the sheep, yes, that's the actual one that is supposed to be said and, you know, is on the tip of their tongue. 
where everything else is fighting it because the brain can't truly um, make sense of you know what it's trying to say. So what I always try to do is take like a, a thing like print, right? Posters and put a twist on it, right? If I'm going to do it, I, I want to, I want to do something new, right? So we created these posters um, to be sent to doctor's offices and you'll see it in the case film, but we, we gave them kind of worksheets and these worksheets, think of them as like checking boxes of, you know, can you say the word? And if you could say like all 30 or 40, right. And that your, your retrieval of words will start to improve and we can track it over time. So this became a diet, this became a tool, um, for the doctors to use besides just like an ad that would show up somewhere in, in, in a, you know, in a magazine. So here's the case film for it. After the accident and with aphasia, it, it was very heartbreaking that I couldn't communicate my thoughts and my feelings. So when a brain suffers an injury or a trauma, it can cause a condition called literal paraphasias. This can lead the patients mixing up words that contain similar sounds. I would think and think and try to find it searching in my head, like, what is that word? And it's, I just never find it ever. So it, that's what's so frustrating. The posters for the speech app Constant Therapy doubled as clinical tools to help my patients practice and improve speech parameters. Um, sh sharks and um, shirts and a sheep. <laughs> The struggle of having the word be at the tip of their tongue can be so frustrating. I just get, I just start searching and searching and digging and digging and digging, and it's just, I get nothing. The worksheets that accompany these posters help explain how to use them with my patients. Truck, um, truck. I definitely see a trophy. Um, troopers. Having visual, like, just like a really cool piece of art that I think that's like the perfect kind of tool um, is to tie it together um, visually. These posters help my patients find the right words in all situations of their lives. After a brain injury, it can be a fight to get the right word out. That is exactly what it feels like. I feel really fortunate to meet all of these people and kind of see the difference we're making, like, you know, as film, as artists and all of us, we, we love to shoot film, right? Content. How do we kind of bring things to life? So that is like the extra gravy, so to speak. You come up with these ideas and then you get to meet people and you uh, get to hear their stories and it just inspires you to do it for the next person, you know, on the next thing that you're working on. Um, so that by the time you're done, like every single, you know, disease state that is at area 23, I want to touch and want to kind of do something new. It's like a first. So, um, so the next is, um, for gout patients, um, a big thing in, in healthcare is, uh, you, you, there's a lot of like patient videos and patient portraits and telling people's stories and what they've been through and, you know, the disease and how it's kind of affected their body. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's used to bring empathy for doctors. And of course, it's used to kind of share in community and how to be um, helpful for um, for other people that are going through it like yourself. So just to try to bring awareness is always a very big thing. So this was just last year as well. Um, we call it toxic portraits. And uh, for gout, that is something that, you know, ends up in your feet. They call it like rich man's disease and it's got all these things. But in the end, there's genetics involved in here, right? This is not just like your diet and the way you eat. It's just, you know, it could be passed down, right? And what I would call it the enemy, the toxic part of it is uric acid. 
and more uric acid that builds up in your system, that's what kind of causes these like inflamed, big, huge toes and all of these things. The pain can be extraordinary, right? And what we wanted to do was to bring out the uric acid and have people understand that this uric acid has catastrophic, you know, damage that it can cause throughout the body. And we needed, um, I, I wouldn't say that doctors dismiss the uric acid, but let's just say that in their minds, they do blame, they blame a couple different things. They blame diet, they blame everything. And in the end, um, if they could just be a little bit more empathetic to the pain and suffering that uric acid brings, perhaps we can start to help change treatment a little bit. Um, so that's what this particular um, project did. Gout is caused by too much uric acid, but most of its damage goes unnoticed. Toxic portraits. We brought artists and printmakers together with real gout patients to understand the true burden of the disease. Then we did something never attempted before. For each patient, we created custom uric acid mixtures corresponding to the severity of their disease. In an unprecedented spin on an old craft, master printmakers applied this uric acid mixture to copper plates in a first of its kind experiment. We knew uric acid was corrosive, but it disintegrated the copper. This stuff is swimming around in people's blood. Anyone touched by gout should see this. Thank you for coming tonight, especially our doctors and our patients, for the unveiling of toxic portraits. These portraits depict more than gout. They allow us to come face to face with the toxic truth about uric acid. If it can eat through metal, I wonder what it is doing to my gout patients. It's hard to look at this, knowing that it's made of the very substance that nearly wrecked my body and my life. But it also makes me hopeful that people see these portraits and understand the toxic nature of uric acid so we can put an end to unnecessary gout suffering going forward. Um, so just to kind of move on a little bit, uh, we're calling it, this is like a, in healthcare is filled with creating services, you know, and things to help patients kind of not miss out on life. Uh, but the twist here is like, uh, I, I'd, I'd say the industry, it was, gets concerned at times to use humor. So once I heard that, I'm like, I, I want to start bringing humor into all, almost all, uh, you know, a lot of my work. Right. Um, so this thing is for, um, for shingles. Shingles is a very painful rash, right? Um, it's kind of like, you know, it can appear out of nowhere. It's usually maybe presents around the spine, around your neck. It could even, you know, get into your eyes. Um, and it, it's, it's very painful. And what it does is it clearly makes you miss out on things in life, right? Um, because you're either bedridden, no one under, no one truly really gets how much pain there is. But with that, you know, everyone's always talked about like, don't miss life's precious moments. I'm like, I'm not doing that crap. I'm not doing it. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a stand-in service that, um, and this is all for HCPs to understand the empathy and, you know, to realize what their patients are truly missing out on. Um, but to create a stand-in service where they will send people to life's most important moments and they will bring in the casting. You can work with them and make sure, you know, like that if you need a mom for a reason, you need an uncle, you need a whoever it is um, to be at these events. That's what we're here for. So you're not going to miss out on life. So to just take a little bit of levity, a little bit more, uh, um, a kind of a different approach to um, what I think is like a story that people have been telling since the day I got in this business and they forever will. This blank product, this, I'm sorry, this blank disease causes this much pain and this blank product can help you with that. So I wanted to put a twist on it. Uh, 
characters you should have. No. Irene would have been angry. Yeah, but like funny angry? Mm -hmm. Funny angry. And Irene would have been So our real Aunt Irene is in bed with shingles? Yeah, so we hired this lady to be her stand in. Surprise! No, you didn't. You know I don't like surprises. You know why? Because it scares me. And you scared me. Now I'm going to scare you. Oh, a little too much. Poor Irene. Should be the life of the party, but is missing it because of how much pain she is in from her shingles rash. That's why we're here. To stand in. Aren't you handsome? You're supposed to be my aunt. Leslie, we talked about this. <laughs> so we did one more. Oh, what a nice grandchild baby that is. Who's the stranger and where's my mom? I know you want her to be here, but she's at home in bed. With shingles. Oh no, mom's got shingles. But I got us to stand in. Her name's Elaine. Oh, call me mom. It keeps me in the role. Poor Melanie. Experiencing the debilitating pain of shingles instead of the birth of her grandchild. That's why we're here. To stand in. Oh, uh, do you want to hold her, mom? No, I'm good. Well, I'd hold her, but my hands are full. Um, so just in a kind of a, a lighter, just, you know, work that uh, goes out and, you know, it's uh, some posters, you know, just knowing what we've been through with COVID um, and now with the flu is, you know, the rates that are so high. Um, you know, if we're going to do work, we want to make sure it's 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 super clever. So the idea that the flu can live anywhere anything can get sick essentially um just reminders to get the flu shot right really simple high craft uh as we talked about with regulations and with everything like they can't tell me what are they going to tell me there's too much mucus like how do i qualify that there's too much mucus they they can't there's too much mucus coming from a phone uh, i would like any legal department to tell me they don't even have they can't track that right so you just find loopholes. You get around things. You try to create work that makes it very challenging for a PRC, which is like the legal department of a said particular company, to um to kind of find faults in things. Right? It's uh it's just being smart and wherever you can. Um. So this one, this is an emotional one. Um. We're called it beyond words, and um. We, uh, a, a team came to me and, you know, they were talking about uh, one of their parents had passed away and they wished that they could have, you know, they could always be with them in a way to kind of the advice they missed out on all of the types of milestones that you need a parent for, um, they missed, you know, so what we did was, um, we found this incredible person who unfortunately had stage four colon cancer. Um, and it took three years to find someone who would want to do this for us because it was very, it was tough. We, we said to them, would you be open to creating videos for your child, um, at their, you know, tr when they get their driver's license or whether they're getting into college or middle school or first dates or like, imagine all these moments and no one would really touch the project. And I think like perseverance, if I've learned was, something you need to have in consumer for sure, but even more so um, here because there's a million reasons for something to die. Um, and fortunately we met him and he had that joie de vie and he knew he was passing, but he's like, I want to do this because if I could be the person who can spark people to want to leave things for their children um, I want to be that person. And that's who we needed. That's and and that's what he needed, right? So I always find like that's what this beautiful business has done is you meet somewhere in the middle 
and that work then lives where it needs to. Um, so it's an app that allows terminally ill patients to be there for their children long after they're gone. And I'll leave it at that. It was May 26th, 2021, that I was diagnosed with late stage four colon cancer. My first thoughts weren't about me, it was about him. What's he going to look like in 10 years? What university is he going to pick? Is he going to be a safe driver? So it's all these things that start coming to mind as potentially my son can grow up without a father. I know as he gets older, my son is going to do amazing things, but he needs a dad. And I'm not done helping him become that person he's going to be. Hey, Brayden, if you're watching this, God called for me. If you're angry, it's okay. If you shut down, it's okay. I'm right here. I started Kulu because I wanted to help people to get their affairs in order. After losing my mum to cancer, I wanted to give people a gift I wish I had had. The ability to hear from the departed during life's defining moments. With Beyond Words, people can now record messages from major milestones to words of wisdom. Then they're aggregated and stored indefinitely. Families access these videos at specific times, predetermined by the departed. Hey, Brayden. Brayden. Hey, Brayden. So you got your license. If mommy's the one that told you how to drive, you better go get lessons. <laughs> I want you to make sure that you have good friends that will take good care of you. If you don't know what to do after college, don't panic. And I know that you love traveling. I really hope you grow up to be a travel blogger. It's your wedding day. I hope you married your best friend. You and mom are gonna become closer than ever. Be strong and be present for her. The thought of Brayden having videos through life puts me at peace knowing that I can still be there with him even if I'm not there physically. And he passed about three months after we created this. And his, you know, so it, it's just, uh, I feel like, you know, I feel fortunate to be in this business um, and to be able to do things for people. Um, this is the last one. Uh, this is for motor neuron disease, ALS, right? Um, so this is the last, um, everyone's been tapping into AI for all the different reasons as we should be, right? Um, so here we thought to ourselves, you know, and I'm sure we've all seen, you know, from bucket challenges and everything, we're very familiar with ALS and, and motor neuron diseases. Um, and there's been incredible advancements, right? And there's been, um, people who have been banking their voice, right? People have been, you know, really helping people communicate a lot more, um, when maybe their body fails them. So here, what we thought was... <clears throat> While they're banking voices, it's really hard because we're not banking emotion as much. It, it, it feels a little robotic in some respects. You can't see what's going on, the color, the magic, the, the, the vivid nature of, of, of life's expressions, right? And we know that AI, you know, lets us do that. Um, you know, we've got mid-journey. We've got everything at our fingertips right now. They do not. So what we did was we partnered with um, GridPad and um, a few different companies to basically do, I activated, um, let's just, you know, what we all do and we take for granted, which is so simple for us, um, for them to kind of share their vivid visual emotions of what they're going through besides the words that they're communicating. So this opened up for a lot of the patients that we had met, um, a whole entire world where they can kind of share how they're feeling with their family and friends. And this is the case form for that. Motor neuron disease is a neurological condition. People struggle to, to walk and to talk and to eventually breathe. And it's a condition that has no cure. I am so grateful for this device. It does not let me express anything about me. At least the essence is lost and I find that frustrating. When people listen to sound wave, they really feel super... Some of these people were supposed to be my friends. These are just regular people who have a rare disease that prevents them from communicating as themselves until now.
Introducing Mind's Eye. Mind's Eye is the world's first AI art expression tool for people with MND. I love the idea of generating images to be able to send to others to communicate my feelings. Mind's Eye is a mobile app built to overcome major accessibility barriers with AI tools. Now, even users with almost no mobility can easily create and share images just by moving their eyes. The MND community are making this tool their own. Some are having more nuanced conversations whilst working through some difficult feelings. The image that Louise just uh, put up on screen for me uh, is difficult to describe without being emotional, but it just shows how locked into a body she is. To make inputs easy, one simply needs to type their subject, then choose from a library of style presets, then share through SMS, email, or social media. Maybe you try your feelings for your day. I was never interested in art until I started using mindset, but I am saying what I want with art. I really miss banter and being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> The things I do make, I am most excited to make myself understand. So I'll stop sharing there. Um, I know that's a lot, uh, you know, a lot of different emotions and along the way, but I think that's, that's this business, you know, um, and, you know, I feel fortunate enough to, you know, be part of it and um, be part of um healthcare at a moment where we're like at such an incredible inflection point that I've never been prouder. Like I was at can two years ago and uh, my sister's in the business. Cause Lord knows if you're a graph, you need to be in advertising. So um, her uh, <laughs> chief creative officer was there and he's like, uh, we had just won something. And he was just like, well, come on, come back to consumer. And you know, I was like, nothing in this world, I will never go back to consumer. And, and in my wildest dreams, I never would have thought I would have ever said that, but that's how happy I personally am and what I'm being given from the healthcare industry um, and healthcare communications. So it's a, it's just a huge shift, you know, without, you know, like, I feel like the sixties was the creative revolution for the Beatle, most one Beatle and all those great things. And I think it, it opened it up for all of us. Like I got to thank all those people who, set the stage for us to to do to be in this business and i feel like healthcare is having its golden age right now and we're in I'm, i feel like i'm in it um i'm and we're uh every day we're getting new opportunities to uh to do work that has never been done before um for clients who are ambitious and want to put it out there um so i'll kind of leave it at that you know lift about 10 minutes um you know questions about the work questions about healthcare. Um, this side, I'm sure there must be. Anna, yes. Hello. First of all, wonderful, wonderful work. Um, it was really beautiful, very moving, um, funny in some aspects. Uh, what really struck me, though, and I wanted to ask you about, is how do you bring these people who have connections, experiences, or knowledge that you guys personally don't have? Like, for example, um, the blind man that helped you create the echolocation one. Yes. Um, how do you, how's the process of finding these people and inviting them to work with you? It's a great question. Um, so th there's a few, a few things when you have, um, a client will sometimes have connections through advocacy groups. So you start with them, which is always pretty fruitful. I'd say, um, some people want to be involved, some people don't, but it opens doors. And those doors, if some, you know, someone doesn't want to do it, someone else will. So that helps a lot. And then the other side of it is, is the hustle. Same as when I started when I was 22, like I, I put the same amount of hustle in. I'm calling, I'm emailing, I'm every day, 10 people, 15 people. The next day, no response, no response until we get the response. Kind of like Kilo took three years. And how that happened was I happened to see an article on CNN about him living his life the way he does. And his story was so 
empowering that I was like, he seems like someone who would be interested. I reached out, got his information. He wrote me back. And after three years of, of not being able to achieve the project, he, he th it happened because it was a Sunday night at like 7.20 and I saw this article. So it, it that's it. I mean, that's the beautiful thing. If we're all, we want to create things, we get as much help as we can from the professionals and then it relies on us sometimes. So I hope that answered your question. It does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, sure. Uh, is it Elia? Elia? Yeah, Elia. Elia, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really liked um, all your projects and what you did, but I have a question about um, the economic part. Like, is it all these things are like really technological and all this stuff? And as far as I know, there's no public health is called in the US. So I don't know if all these things are affordable or how did you manage to, to get to um, all these um, products to get them to almost everyone? Sure. Um, and I, I just want to make sure I'm answering the correct, like, you know, we have a lot of products that are just funded from the client, right? So we have budgets give, being given. Is it is your question about how we how to have the money to create these or how to have money to put them out there. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Um, it's about if did how did you make them affordable, all this technology and all this and Perfect. really yeah. Yeah. for example, like the alarm clock. Um we have things called the Sunshine Acts, right? So I think it, it over fifteen dollars, you can't give it to somebody because it will sound like you're um, trying to persuade them to be on your brand. So uh, what we do is we just work with engineers and we figure out how to be a cost-effective way to create these so that we can bring it out from a mass level. Like think about an app, apps like there's a free app, right? It's open source, you know, like, you know, sometimes if the app's like $3 because there's so much utility on it, we're still well below the sun, you know, the Sunshine Act. So that's how we just do it. You know, we've got the budgets from the clients, and we have the media budgets that they give us to put it out there. And we also have the the um, the common sense to make them inexpensive so that we can have all these products and put them in people's hands. Um, Esteban? Yeah, Jason. Uh, well, first, thank you for sharing your experience and your work. I think it's really great because, as you said, like working with consumers, it's like selling ideas and selling concepts. And you are like... Also giving opportunities to these people that somehow are limited in many ways. So it's really, really good that you're giving that way to the community. And my question is like really similar to Anna's question. Like basically, I want to know how do you find out about these technologies that will help you land your ideas, you know, like for the second idea that you shared about the the blind people and the echo sound, like how did you get to that um, yeah. technology? How did you learn that the smartphones had that future that will help you create the app? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have- um... Yeah, because like I'm working on a project also right now that it's like aiming to deaf people and how would I like search uh, what technologies or what can I use to create what I'm trying to do, you know? Of course. Um, so to answer your question, we have an innovation department, right? We have engineers. We have all, so we start with that. We Once we have an idea, we go to Aaron Stack. When in doubt, you always say, go to Aaron Stack because he's our top guy. We go and he will figure out um, if he can't physically make it, if he can't figure it out, what we'll do is because we had budgets like the previous question, he will then outsource and we'll create the team. And we usually keep it as nimble as possible that team will put it together. So like if you had an idea and we're working together, I'd say, let's go to Aaron Stack. You know, and if you have an idea that you're trying to put together, um, you know, let's connect after this. I'll connect you with Aaron. Maybe Aaron would spend some time to either consult on your project. And if he can't do it, he'll try to figure out how to help you. Um, so happy to offer that up. Um, yeah, that would be great. You no, know, let me just... Uh, let me just put this in here just so you have, let me put my email in here so everyone has it. Um, please reach out to me and I'll reach out to Aaron Stack and maybe we can do something. Um, so there you go. Uh, Maria. Hi. Yeah. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, I'll keep my question short. I came from 
a healthcare background. I was working on like the account side of the healthcare okay. uh, account. And I'm just curious because I wanted to get more into the creative side of things. So I thought I would have to go to consumer. So it's funny to hear your, your point of view of things. Um, but is there anything that like any clients that you worked on or any projects that like you really had to change or like reroute your whole idea because of their feedback? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm What I'm showing you today are the top 10, right? Mm -hmm. 10 wins when all the moons align and everything works really well, right? But I think you need to show the ceiling in order to like figure out how to make the day-to-day -day great uh, constantly, right? But what I feel maybe compared to healthcare, compared to consumers, I've had some amazing strategists, right? Um, and I find in healthcare, they're smarter, they're more nimble. And when you have account people like, you know, like, say like yourself, like people who would tr truly support the idea, um, we'd find ways to work with the client to get the best outcome. You don't always win. And they may make you put one thing in you're not happy about. But what I try to do is tell clients, please at least give us one or two put into test. Let we're none of us are actually the owners of a brand, the consumer and the doctors are, right? So we try to get at least one or two in, but it's a it's a gamble when they start to tell me about art direction. I say then I pull the whole regulated, you know, thing like let's let's not get into that right now. Right. Let's mm -hmm. let's sell an ad. Let's get into it later. Mm -hmm. Um but it is a challenge. You know, it's not like a blue sky thing. It's, you know, you have a lot of losses and you have a lot of wins. I just think whatever you do, work for an agency that has more wins and has the track record for it, because mm -hmm. then there's hope when you lose some of your bigger ideas. But what I've also learned is I've taken those ideas and gone to nonprofits. I've done, you know, I've told the client, hey, I'd like, I send them a letter and say, can you sign this? Can I release this? Can this be advocacy work? Oh, cool. For other clients. Yeah. for advocacy. Uh -huh. And I've had two things live that way. So it's, it's never ending hustle and it's, and having thick skin and knowing things are going to die, mm -hmm. but it's okay. You know, we're in this business, you know, to come up with ideas. So it's, you know, it's the way it is, you know, yeah. could have harder <laughs> jobs. Uh, loose. Is it loose? Yes. Hi. I, Jason, Hi. um, uh, your presentation is very, very inspiring and it touches home. Um, I am the creative services manager for San Isidro Health. We are a one of the largest uh, nonprofit organizations in San Diego. Uh, hmm. We are a, an FQHC. Yep. Um, we create content in-house. There's actually three of my graphic designers here in this meeting, as soon as I saw it, I was like, we need to join this because it touches home. Yeah. So um, your videos are very inspiring. Um, I saw that Odette also had her hand up. She's another one of my graphic designers. So if she has a question, I want her to ask questions. Of course. Every year we create videos that um, for our gala. So we work with the philanthropy team and we create the call to action videos and your videos where we were crying. We were sending each other oh. messages like, I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, this really touched home. I want to say thank you for giving us this talk. Um, we are, I think we're getting very inspired from this to advocate, to make videos that, with our patients, to make sure that we do find our patients that can talk about the difference that we have made in their life, helping them with their health. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's amazing working on healthcare. I come from a healthcare background. I started processing data entry while I was going to college. I ended up advocating for patients to get their devices for uh, a program that was covered through the county. So all of this, it's just, it's amazing yeah, to hear. I'm glad you feel that way, yeah. It's like, I think either people are in or they're out or they're, you know, jaded or, you know, some people are like, no, I won't, you know, I don't want to go into it. It's, you know, but when your heart is in it, you can feel it. And, you know, I always love to meet people who um, feel that way, right? Because uh, then you're part of like the yes crowd of this is, let's get this done. Let's figure out a way. Let's make content. Let's do this for this gala. Let's create this moment. Let's try to find this patient. Let's try to find this 
you know, whoever you need to bring it to life. So, um, yeah, that's great. So uh, I think it's a uh, healthcare and graphic design. It's, uh, it's one of the most gratifying jobs because you are working to make a difference for someone else out there. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Jason, if, you, if we could get in touch with you to maybe pick your brain, it would be absolutely. Amazing. Please reach out. I put that's why I put my email in. Like I'm, I'm here to help. You know, let's let's talk. I mean, this is all about making connections, right? So that we can, you know, maybe we will all partner on something, or we'll figure out, you know, what we can do. Like that's that's what this is all about. Awesome. Uh, Thank you so much, Jason. Of course, to hear from us. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to. I look forward to it. Uh, Ellie, Eli. Sorry. Uh, Eli, yeah. <clears throat> um, first of all, thank you. That was a uh, really amazing work you showed. I just have one question. Um, you talked a little bit about like having to find legal loopholes to be able to max out your creative freedom and expression. Do you right. also find that you have to find social loopholes sometimes? Because healthcare is like an industry where the public opinion is always swaying. And that has nothing to do with you. It's like you know, it's has to do with politics and social issues, and it's a lot of external factors. So how do you kind of wiggle around in those loopholes and, you know, stay up to date with how everyone feels socially in this country? Um, I mean, it's a good question. I just finished, um, I just finished a, a commercial this fall for um, Travis Kelsey did a, I, I work with him for Pfizer to do um, two, th I don't know if anyone saw it, but it was two things at once, like get your flu shot and get your COVID shot. Right. And um, you know, he's like talking to press while he's bench pressing and all that. And what I didn't realize, and I would say um, whenever I'm looking for, to create work, I'm trying to look for the earned media right? You have owned media, which is like what you're creating. And then the earned is, of course, as you know, everything that comes from it. Um, I didn't, you know, from social sentiment, you know, the, the, the vax, you know, wars have been going on for years. Little did I know that Aaron Rodgers, I'd stoke Aaron Rodgers. And then Aaron Rodgers is stoking Kelsey. And then we're creating this whole thing with red states and blue states and all of it. And I don't know if there's any way to get around all of that. Like, I don't have a great answer to your question, other than I actually like to create cultural moments that are like zeitgeist moments. And of course, do we have our PR teams and do we have our social um, looking at everything before we go to like figure out how to best leverage messages and who to leverage them from and the issues that may arise from it? I didn't see this one coming. I mean, I knew that there would be some backlash, but what we ended up doing which was interesting to ride the social is Aaron Rodgers was like, you're Mr. Pfizer. And um, we had nothing to do with Travis Kelsey saying, well, I guess with the mustache and everything, I guess maybe I look like Mr. Pfizer and, you know, Hey, if I'm, uh, if I'm helping to protect a couple million, you know, billion people, well, that's great. Considering Aaron Rodgers works for the J, you know, he's J and J company owns the jets. Right. So there was a little bit of, so, we ended up creating a social campaign where the next town he was going to in Minneapolis, we were like, hello, Mr. Pfizer. And we created jerseys that had Mr. Pfizer. We did a whole outreach program. So we like, we went deep into social sentiment and actually started to kind of move it in our direction so that we're not chasing it. So every time it's different, like every uh, Trojan condoms, I worked on a commercial and uh, you know, they were like, um, we just said use a condom every time. That was the end of um, we did a commercial with a bunch of pigs, men uh, hitting on girl women. And, you know, one has a condom and he turns into a man. Right. But because we didn't have an uh, an STI message at the end of it, um, it immediately got picked up from the news and it was an issue. But we purposely didn't put it on because we we added on our website but we didn't have a big media buy. So we figured let's get into the news and let's have social drive conversation by not including that. And then we didn't lose any points. I mean, we have a, we have a safety message and it was all over our site, but um, we just make decisions sometimes. And it's, that's the beauty. Like uh, my wife always says, she's like, you really love to have lightning rod moments where like you like to create these things where it are, um, where it, it could be divisive, you know, but at the same time, I'm good with that because it's like, let's see what social has to say, right? And um, 
So I don't know if that fully answered your question, but I feel like that's just the way we approach things. You know, we uh, we do our best we can, and then we uh, we scramble with what happens. In in healthcare, there's a lot of turnoff. Like, you know, if, if you take a look, you'll see there's not a lot of social comments on YouTube. A lot of social is turned off there for legal reasons. Um, so that's unfortunate, I would say. But when you start doing social campaigns like Kelsey and everything else, it's great because I kind of feel like I'm fully backing consumer and um, I'm getting to like push the push the conversation. Um, but uh, Odette. Thank you. You're welcome. You got it. Hi. Hi, Jason. Um, I, again, want to thank you so much. It's really inspiring. And I thought when you said that it would get emotional, I kind of thought nah, that's not going to get too emotional, but I was bawling. So thank you for that. And uh, just bouncing off uh, Eli's question about the loopholes, yes. uh, working in healthcare, being in a creative uh, team, we do get a lot of pushback. We get yeah. so much pushback just by kind of um, people further up. Uh, they just kind of see what's on social media and be like, no, we kind of have to differentiate but not reinvent the wheel so when we do have creative ideas they get either denied or pushed back or reduced to something very along what's already out there right. um, what would be your suggestion when you get so much pushback that you kind of feel very frustrated um, being in a creative agency um, sometimes you thrive on maybe getting those uh, lightning rod moments that you're like, okay, this is gonna, if it's gonna win, it's gonna get enough comments or something's yeah. gonna happen. But in healthcare, you kind of can't have that wiggle, wiggle room pretty much. So what would be your suggestion for a creative team that's giving out ideas, but get so much pushback in this regard to kind of stay within the box, but be creative, but you don't really have a lot to go out of because you're still under branding. And, yeah. And talk to me a little bit just about that. Just from like, I, I there's so many various levels of pushback and I know we, we all go through them. In, give me an example or just a, like when you're talking about social, like just is, are you talking legal pushbacks on like what you can and can't say? Is it about uh, an over promise on the, that the, the drug can't deliver on? I just, so I can get a little bit kind of uh, it's, a little more acutely it's more uh on the creative side for instance we want to uh create a video that has a lot of uh, emotional impact that yeah. can make someone cry laugh and all that sort but then uh comes all the legal stuff to like hey you know we kind of want to put more facts we kind of like yeah. not make it so emotional and then it turns into something else more so like I'll a give you an example. Of highlights yeah so this is the some of the tricks i've done and they work and they don't work i've had success stories uh, my favorite thing, um, is, is creating, you know, digital experiences because, um, the housing of it, right. Your site and everything can handle so much information that the pieces of the work that you're creating can stay pure. So what I do every time with my clients is, okay, what do you want to say? Okay. First of all, give me your hierarchy. You know, every, we all play that game. What's your one, two, three, four, um, cause you know, it's so hard to get clients to agree on just one thing or two things. And then what I do is I sell them on what you're asking for. I can cover in all of the surround that's on your site. I can do it. And I, and this piece that I'm asking you to create this pure piece here, let it be what it needs to be. And I'll give away things like my, my, one of my, one boss once told me, you know, he's like, you know, just give it away in other places. Just don't give it away in your piece. And I, I've done that. Uh, I had a, a oncology. They told me whatever, it's so hard to sell good oncology work. You saw for Lily Oncology, you were able to do that. Um, I was able to like keep that clean because I had everything else around it. And I play that game all the time. I do. Um, Commercials are harder because like you have your safety information in the middle of the spot, digital experiences. I find you could run all that ISI at the end. You know, you could do it. You, you scroll it, you scrim it at the end and it's fine. It's out of the way at that point. I don't care. You know, 
Um, but it, it's it's challenging. I, I, I absolutely challenging. The pushback is, I make people prioritize. I'm like, I, I can't tell people will not be able to understand five things at once. The hard part is we have three, probably things to say about our safety information that you need to super. So that's challenging, but on a print ad or on a digital experience or on an activation, which I love activations or Congress experiences, get the co the copy claustrophobia out of the assignment and, 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 explain to them it needs to move away. If you have a good client and a good relationship, you could do it. If you have an account person who was not supportive, who is more of like a no or a strategist that's a no, or your CEO is not on board, you're never going to win. That's why I'm at Area 23, because we win battles because everyone is pushing. Do I win all of them? No, but I win a, a, a larger amount. And that's that percentage I'll take every day. That's That's the trick. My CEO will call a client and go, what? No, we're not doing that. I'm sorry, we're not doing it. And when she does it, she's like the most persuasive person I know. And that's when it doesn't happen. You can make, and you know, we we make a lot of cases. We, you know, we go into strategy. A lot of times we look at um, the level of emotion that our patients have given us in their feedback and what they've, you know, talked about the disease. I go right to those. I'm like, we are failing them if we're actually being saccharine about their experience, you know? And and honestly, all of this, there's so many smoke and mirrors. I wish I had like a book to give you on everything because every time is different and everything is a negotiation and everything is about having the best team to surround yourself with. And we have run one ride through this business. Find the people you want to be with, make sure you stay with them empower them. And from there, start enjoying your successes together. That's the only way you're ever, I could talk to you forever about 10 different ways to do it, but with the wrong people, none of them will work. Thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate that. Of course. Um, I know we're over time, but I just wanted to thank everybody for you know joining in today. Really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, please reach out. Happy to like get on another chat, you know, if you want to talk or if you needed career advice or, or anything like that. Um, I've worked with DNA D. I did the same thing. Um, I like to work with organizations and I like to help people get where they want to go. So yeah, my contact info. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, excellent. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for your time and, uh, Good luck. Best of luck. Hope uh, everyone has the career they want to have. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. We'll connect. Uh, uh, we'll connect after. But yeah, thank you so, so, so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was great. Cool. Thank you. Take care, everybody. You too. You too. Thank you.